today we're going to be discussing tidy evaluation. Now, chapter 12 is a conclusion of this um, region of shiny in action. So there's, I don't know, seven, eight chapters that are related to uh, shiny and its interactive points or how to how to manipulate it uh, as, a, as a projection tool. Uh, and this tidy evaluation component uh, caps on a uh, topic related to um, the differences between uh, environmental variables and then data variables. And we want to be very clear with that distinction. Reviewing past cohorts, um, cohort one, I didn't, I can't, forgive me for not remembering the individual's name that, that uh, presented this. And then in uh, cohort two, Colin Berkey uh, gave this presentation. I did not find any of that presentation media. Uh, and, and given the conference activities, I did not author anything directly for this particular chapter. So what we're going to do is just be more dynamic. Uh, I'm going to show you some detail within R uh, to highlight the uh, chapter. But as far as presentation is concerned, let me share my screen and I'll show you what I'm, I'm going to do here. Desktop to share and let's move this window there and we'll move this window there. Okay. Um, is everyone uh, able to see the browser and it should be chapter 12 tidy evaluation? Yes. Good. Yes. So in this case, um, as I mentioned, uh, I don't have any learning objectives directly related. So there's no presentation that I'm I'm going to be uh, uh, working within. Um, underneath this browser, I do have our studio up and running, and I have all of the uh, example apps that we're going to express. So as we walk through the topics within the chapter, I'm going to be bouncing back and forth between R and uh, uh, highlighting, showing exactly what the uh, code examples are reflecting. So to start out, the first thing right off the bat is we talk about this motivation, right? Um, imagine I want to create an app that allows you to filter a numeric variable to select rows that are greater than a given threshold. Pretty common task, uh, especially if we're doing some uh, uh, data wrangling or, or some um, gaining some experience or, or, or ideas behind the information that we're going to be projecting. So being able to filter or, or select certain variables uh, outside of our within Shiny to gain some understanding of the content, pretty common practice. However, if we were to run this particular code snippet and we're talking about the use of this uh, data variable, excuse me, let me scroll down here, the environmental variable versus the data variable, the access to that location or the access of how the function of Shiny is going to manipulate that data must be considered. And, and, and the difference that we're comparing here in the chapter, the very first part here, is the tidy models or tidy verse form of data manipulation versus base R. And they do complement each other. However, uh, Tidyverse is a little uh, more intelligent with how they manage that feature uh, versus Base R. You're going to have to write a lot of text to execute exactly the intent you're you're after. And so again, we're going to go we're going to go to this indirection thought process. Um, normally, when you use a Tidyverse function, uh, you type the name of the variable directly into the function call. But now you want to refer to it indirectly. Uh, the variable caret in this uh, diamonds data set is stored inside another variable called input var. Okay, so let me run this example real quick and I'll show you what this error creates. So let's go to R and I should be able to do app one. Get out of that. Yep, okay. And let's pop this over to the browser. Now I did. Uh, I did follow a example that Colin used, uh, which is called Showcase. And if you've never used this feature of Shiny before, um, it, it does help you uh, be able to view the code that you're authoring for the Shiny app to operate, and then the actual output, uh, the web uh, version, the uh, UI version. So what we see on the left-hand side of my screen is the rendered Shiny app. On the 
right-hand side of the screen, this is the code base that makes that app work. Okay, so as we enter data, you're gonna see uh, on this side that the, uh, the app itself, you'll, you'll see this yellow flashing of what code block is being executed. So let's say I'm gonna change this to two, and that's not updating, is it? Price, depth. Yeah, I'm not getting any, any uh, I'm not getting any changes. Um, so if we're comparing over here on the right-hand side of our code snippet, we can see that we've created a select input. That's this drop-down menu here. We're calling it var, and this is the variable. Choices are going to be num vars. The numeric input is going to be labeled min, and then the, the label that we're going to see on the screen is minimum. That's where this comes in. Okay. And then finally, the table output is this window below of our table. This UI correlates to the server output side of data being a reactive call to the diamonds data set, filtering the input var, this variable that we have up here, and populate that into input min. Then the output output would be render table and then the head of the data. So that's what is giving us these values. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing this update though, and I find that odd. But let me go ahead and close that because the example or the reference that we were making here to the reason this, this is a broken, broken code. As you can see in the figure, the app runs without error, but it does not return the correct results. We wanna filter to anything that's greater than the number one. We want the caret to be greater than one. Uh, the problem is indirect. Normally, when using tidyverse functions, you type the name of the variable. I already mentioned that. The sentence might have uh, have been intuitive since to you, but it's not. But it is a bit confusing because I'm using a variable. Okay, this this named object as us being human beings. The word variable has a definition to it um, to mean two slightly different things. First, it's going to be easier to understand what's going on. So we have this environmental variable that's inside our R uh, that uh, we create and we assign using the, uh, I don't know what that, that actual character term is, is referred to as, and I, I should know this based on how many book clubs we went through, but it's an assignment uh, operator. We're creating an object and we're, we're uh, assigning the memory to that named object. So the, in this case, the, the, the name that we're calling it and then what we're actually populating it with. The second point is gonna be this data variable. And this is a st statistical variable that lives inside a data frame. In this case, caret is a data variable. Okay, so input var was what we referenced before. And then we also have this variable called caret. So in essence, it's kind of a mix and match, right? We're, we're using the word variable, but we're, we're, we're projecting it in two different ways. We're expressing it in two different ways. We're expecting it to the computer to figure out what our intent is, okay? With these two name terms, we can make the, uh, say with these new uh, terms, we can make the problem of indirection a little bit more clear. Uh, we have a data variable caret stored inside an environmental variable called input var. Now, Frederica, uh, to your, question, or, or if you don't mind me asking you, particularly with your experience in Shiny, I believe the intent of this chapter or what we're trying to express here is the differences between the RStudio server end of data calculation versus the JavaScript end of how R is, is uh, rendering or what we're asking it to select from. The relationship between this UI and server and in the middle of that, we have one language called input var from the, from the UI end. And then inside the, the R studio side or server side of logic, we have this variable in the data frame called caret. And we need to be able to reference those two together. Am I stating that correctly? Yeah, yeah. We are using this um, input var to uh, like um, release uh, the the elements in the data set that we need 
Okay. And we make a table and summarize all the elements that we uh, are going to use for our uh, analysis. So it's nice okay. to see that there's a few apps. You have app one, app two, app three, uh, yes. etc. So they they all belonging to different uh, data sets. So you mm -hmm. can see how they change it within. Uh, uh, using different uh, elements and uh, how you can make it different. Like, even if it's just slightly different, it, it will pass you the way to customize your own, basically. Right. Um, this next topic is data masking. So data masking functions allow you to use a variable in the current data frame without any extra syntax. Um, it's used in many of the dplyr and ggplot functions. For example, the arrange, filter, group by, mutate, and summarize in dplyr, and then specifically within ggplot is the aesthetics or AES uh, function call. Um, both of which, I, I, I know Frederica has a lot of experience with these details, but Olu, have you worked with any of the ggplot uh, media in the past with your past experience? And I believe Olu may have just dropped out. I don't see him in the session call anymore. Yeah, he's gone. All right, I'll, it's just you and, me, you and me then. All right, so arrange, filter, group, mutate, and summarize are specific functions in the dplyr package. The aesthetics in the ggplot aesthetics is using this data masking thought process. So what I've done is uh, used, sorry, the, the, the two comparisons we're having here. It's calling on a variable named minimum. Uh, it's assigning the value one uh, from the diamonds data set. We are piping uh, or, or passing over to the filter function, the data frame named variable caret, and then being able to show the, the anything that's greater than the minimum of number one. So we wanna see all of the variables that are greater than number one. And the comparison to this in a base R equivalent would be to expressly call on the de diamonds data set and then inside pass the dollar sign, which is a, a pointer, a, a expressed pointer to the caret variable uh, with the greater than minimum. Um, we can also change that slightly using the double square brackets. Um, I'm not as experienced with double square brackets as I probably should be, especially with advanced R. But in this uh, syntax, we're creating a, a named variable called var, uh, asking for the caret uh, uh, expressed detail inside diamonds, diamonds. And then now we're using that string as a search term with the variable var using the double square brackets expressly asking for that point. Um, so now that the second code block, this is the second example I'm going to run here. Um, we've modified the differences between the two. So when I, when I execute this next shiny app, I'm going to go back to app one and compare what we were doing previously into the second version, this second example. So give me a second move over here and let's stop that server. And I'm gonna go, excuse me, run example two. And pop that out to the browser. Okay. Um, we're doing identical thought process. The objectives are the same. We want all of our variables that are greater than one. Previous, the uh, first example, uh, wasn't operating properly because the relationship between input var and then caret between the, the requested uh, named object versus the variable name in the, in the data frame. Here we've resolved that by being able to uh, tie those two together. And to do that, we're using this environmental input. So we're, we're adding a dot notation environment focusing on the name variable input min. So by changing our number, let's see if this thing's working, should update. Yeah, go back to one. I don't see the code block highlighting like it has been in the past. Maybe I'll, I'll see this here in a second. But the difference between this app one version 
in the app two version, you can see that the UI is no different. It doesn't change between the two. They are identical code base, right? It's the server or this uh, more specifically, this output line is what changes. I guess the data changes and the output. So here, uh, see that. Second. No, it's just this data line that changes between the two. So in the first example, we have reactive, we have a reactive call with the diamonds data set, piping to filtering, uh, passing over to the filtering function. We're looking for input var greater than input min. In the second example, we are expressly calling dot data input var and then dot environment input min. We're relating the two together between what is happening outside in Shiny versus what is happening inside the R kernel or the R server function. And so that resolves the, the error. And now we're getting all of our inputs greater than one. Previously, it wasn't working that way. Uh, we, were, we, were, we were passing in erroneous information, things that we were not looking for. And if, uh, if a person is not familiar with this particular method of evaluation, they may be uh, inadvertently creating some code that or creating a script that doesn't operate as intended. Let's go back to Chrome. No, go back to uh, R. Excuse me. There we go. Okay, so the next example is going to be using ggplot and the aesthetics uh, 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 function as well, uh, this, this next expressed detail. So prior was all dplyr detail. The next is gonna be a, an example of ggplot following the, a, a, similar, a similar example. Now, what I found when I rendered this, just keep in mind, um, I'm not, uh, what's that called? When you break the two graphs together with each other. Uh, the I noticed when I executed the browser, uh, I'm not giving it, it's, it's dynamically taking up too much space. So I'm going to have to zoom out to get that showcase window to populate. So it's saying here we're using the ggforce position uh, for auto so that the geom point works nicely regardless of whether the x and y variables are con continuous or discrete uh, values. Alternatively, we can all allow the, the user to pick the geome. Um, in this case, we're going to use a switch function, uh, which is kind of like a selector. And we can switch between point equals geome point, smooth equals geome smooth, and then jitter if we want to incorporate it. Okay. Um, I believe this is the next example. So let me stop that server uh, web page. Let's go back to R and run example three. And when I go to the browser here, um, I just want everyone to know that I'm not going to be able to zoom in as close. Uh, this graph takes up the entire space of the page. So by reducing the size, then I can see our code block. So I apologize as I'm zooming away from this, it's going to be difficult to, to see in the video and, and for you to, uh, to witness as well. But again, what we're looking for is inside the uh, output render plot, uh, we have some dot notation to the aesthetic where we've got data input, sorry, dot data input X and then dot data input Y. Uh, and this is a double square, back, uh, double square bracket form of notation. Let me go back to R because it is easier to see in this respect. Close that for a second, let's go to files. App three. And specifically what I'm wanting the user to view is we have the aesthetic call inside our output or ggplot package. Inside the aesthetic call, we're using a dot notation. And then with the square brackets, we're explicitly requesting input X and input Y. This is both references 
to the UI request of variable names X and Y. Uh, I was um, thinking about that. We are not using uh, a reactive function. Uh, not in this particular ggplot, we are not, no. Did I, did I say reactive? If I did, I apologize. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, no, this isn't, this isn't necessarily reactive. We're not wrapping anything around a updating sort of reset form of reactive. Uh, it's just rendering the X and Y coordinate values that we're putting into the, into the browser. Let me go back to the screen real quick, Frederica. Um, I'm going to exclude this little app here so we can focus on the inputs we're rendering. So we're using the iris data set. And for example, we've got sep uh, sepal length and then sepal length for our Y variable. Let's change this to sepal width. And then you can start seeing that the X and Y coordinates are changing. This isn't necessarily reactive by changing the input values, the data requested from the server gets repopulated to render the ggplot output. So we're using these two names, passing it to the server. The server is handing us back this information. It's not necessarily reactive. Uh, that's a good, good uh, note. And the next example with this ggplot is going to be the switch function where I can select the different forms. So let me stop this and go to example three. To R. And I want to apologize for me jumping around so much in all of these various windows. Let's go input four, example four. Um, again, what we're doing with this is just adding another named variable uh, called geom. And this is that switch function that is allowing us to choose what form of generated output uh, graphical object we're creating. So if I want geom smooth uh, or geom jitter, and then change our X and Y coordinate systems respectfully to be able to give us a little bit of a different output. So this third point, this geom variable object, this selector that we're creating, um, it's nested inside that switch function so that it's passing what we want it to be. Uh, in this point, it's point smooth and jitter. And then it renders the, the uh, graphical object output respectful to that request. Go back to our code base here. Stop that. Close that, open up example four. So here's our switch function. And this is this is called input geom. That's the named variable that we're expecting. The three points, or sorry, three rendering engines that we're using is point smooth and jitter. So it's geom point, geom smooth, geom jitter. Um, in respect to the data, though, the data frame, the iris information that is our, you know, sepal length, sepal petal, uh, et cetera, this is called dot data. And then inside dot data, we want to expressly request input X and then input Y. And these two points here are these named variables of our select input. one of which is coming from, excuse me, this is an input from the UI, the web browser side, and then we're putting that inside, telling our studio um, or the R kernel, the server, and that we're using the Iris data set and we want dot data input X dot data input Y. And if I'm interpreting this incorrectly, uh, please correct me. I, I know it's only the two of us, uh, Frederica and Olu. As I'm, as I'm comparing or, or witnessing this tidy evaluation, the intent behind what would be base R's 
use of filtering versus, or relationship, I guess, uh, versus what is occurring within the tidyverse form of this. Yeah, I'd like to just mention that it's interesting that you are using a ggplot and, and then you plot the geom after that. Mm -hmm. So you use the function ggplot yes. as uh, you normally do. Then you add the data, uh, which in this case is iris. And then the aesthetic is populated with uh, um, um, like uh, an inside function. This dot data goes inside to grab the input, basically. And uh, then you don't use the various geom, but you plot the geom. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, you're right. I, I see what you're referring to this, this yeah. particular plot geom is the reference up here to the switch function of what we're selecting, right? Yeah. Um, let me go back real quick, because I you you made a comment that is very important. So in the server side function call of rendering this ggplot, the geome itself, excuse me, the graphical object. So we're calling on the iris data set, and the UI is aware of what the iris data set is. The server is aware of what the iris data set is. More importantly, though, is within the aesthetic, ggplot as a function doesn't know what input x is. ggplot as a function on the server side doesn't know what input y is. And so the, the, the reference that I'm making or trying to tie these two together, we're passing a UI object x and y. Now they're called input x and y, the, the, the slider input, or sorry, select input um, um, giving us that drop down menu is called input. And then the named variable that we have assigned is x and y. In the server side, in the uh, R, uh, keep calling R Studio, in the in the server's function of management of being able to interpret what the UI is passing to it, it doesn't know what input X and Y is, because if if we're using the Iris data set, there is no variable name X and Y. However, however, because of the Iris relation here, data set. And in addition, the same reference, we can, we can wrap that or, or explicitly say this input X is going to be a reference to the named variable from the UI into the server's side. And because it's pointing at the dot data notation, <clears throat> we're saying that sepal width, sepal length, uh, pedal width, pedal length, all of that's going to be named variables inside dot data. So now the, the two are, are aware of each other. They, they know what they're trying to do. If I were to remove this dot data from the notation and then try to render it, I'm going to get an error because the server itself has no idea what we're passing to it. I don't have an input X and input Y in my data set that I can, I can reflect with. So therefore, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to pass you back an error saying, I have no idea what you're asking for. These are not named variables. They're not familiar to, to the, the equation that you're, you're requesting. Yeah. It, was, it was similar to the, to the previous example, that example three that I had, uh, yes, where we were calling it dot data and dot environment. Uh, no, sorry. App two, yeah, uh, app two, this is a deep layer example, a filtering function. But in this case, the filter itself must know the difference between what the UI is asking for versus what the data has available to it. Um, so by adding the dot data, double square brackets, input variable, and then double, sorry, dot environment, square bracket, uh, sorry, input minimum, we're expressly telling the system what we're asking to, to search for. The, uh, the two are now aware of each other. If we were to remove that, um, it would not 
process the media properly. It wouldn't, it wouldn't render properly. Uh, let me go back to the browser and I'll keep going down this chapter. Um, we can use the same technique uh, within dplyr. The following app extends the previous simple example to allow us to choose a variable to filter, uh, being a minimal value to select and a value uh, to sort by. Um, in this, I'll, I'll render this in a second, but what I want to realize what's going on here, what this code base is doing. When we select a variable name, we are getting the minimum and the maximum values of that that uh, variable, okay, all values in that variable name, we want the minimum and the maximum from it, then use that data to populate our slider min max. Choose a value within the range of the minimum maximum of that variable name. Okay, and then it will it will populate below. Let's go run that and we'll show you what's going on. So this should be example five. And let's push that to the browser. And if I zoom out just a bit, I should be able to see the showcase. OK, showcase isn't working. Um, in this example, we're using the miles per gallon. If I change well, right now, you see that the minimum is 10.4 and the maximum is 33.9. If I change my variable name right, to cylinder, you can see that the slider now changes from 4 to 8. If I select displacement, right, the engine size, then it changes to 71.1 all the way up to 472. I guess the, the, the response of this shiny app example or using the dplyr filtering function is we're calling out the minimum maximum within that variable information, the, the minimum and maximum values within that, that uh, named variable, and then populating those inputs to the slider as a function. As I move this back and forth, it just changes the, the values, um, filters them, sorts them. But I was more intrigued with being able to select our, our, our column of data. I, don't, I wanna be careful that I'm not confusing the, the concept of a data frame slash uh, what exactly is rendering the table below. But each one of these columns have a list of information, minimum and maximum values. It's looking at the minimum max, populating the slider. So your, your, your boundaries um, are dynamic. It changes based on what you're selecting to choose from. So. And then if we, if we sort, the, the sort function is just a, uh, yeah, another minimum and maximum. It's, it's, it's taking the lowest value, putting it at the top of the table, and then increments uh, to the bottom. And if I want to sort in a different variable, again, it's using that same min max value. Let's go check out the code base for this as an example. It's not so much what the library is doing, it's more of how this tidy evaluation concept is working. So let's open up app five. So we have a, a, a select input variable name var, a, a slider input min, and then a select input as sort, and then rendering the table. That's just our UI. So that builds the scaffolding of what the web page would look like. The more important element for this Shiny app to operate is the server's side of logic. And in this case, we've got the observe event called input var, uh, the range being range using the empty cars data set and then square, double square brackets input var. So these two are the, the actual same input, but we're using them in two different ma uh, manners. Then we have the update slider input that was the reference I was making to the minimum and maximum of the slider. Um, using session, excuse me, session minimum, the value equals range one minimum range one and max range two. As we populate or render the table, uh, we've got output data, render table, 
using the empty cards data set filter, excuse me, pipe pass over to the filter function with dot data input var and then input minimum and then pass that again over to the arrange function of data input sort. So the sort is what's giving us that increasing form of, of sorting. We can select what we're sorting from. Any thoughts in this example? Again, uh, yeah, I find it interesting the fact that you can uh, add different type of uh, inputs, like you have a slider, you, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so the, uh, you can select elements uh, and everything is in the UI. Then you, in the server, just uh, go to update the slider input. Mm -hmm. And in the session, you just mention min not uh, the other side of the uh, the mean and max and value okay yeah well and, and i guess from a from a an entry level shiny users perspective uh, maybe somebody that's not as advanced in shiny uh, with kind of the, the concepts here really at the core of what the chapter is conveying for any user so you've you've done a bunch of data wrangling and manipulation in r now we're going to project this into a web output side that provides us this more interactive form. But how do I tie the web browser to my R script, this server side logic? How can I connect those two together? And again, the reference or the, the comparison that the chapter is referring to is between base R and versus the, uh, versus the tidyverse method. And this tidy evaluation is saying, I need to be able to take what the browser is providing me, what the user, us, through Shiny, is providing the server. I need to take that named variable and then connect that to a point of familiarity or a point of reference inside the server's end to be able to link those together. As I select an input, be able to render that inside my, my server output, sorry, server side, and then project that back out to the UI. Um, I apologize, but I, I'm continually in Shiny trying to ensure the user is aware of the differences between the UI and the server because they, they are two components, but the relationship between the two is they're, they're continually passing information amongst themselves. So if the UI, if we're creating this select input and this you know, min-max value uh, sorting function, et cetera, that's great. That provides the scaffolding to the web page, okay? but how do I use that information and then provide some arithmetic calculation, some kind of a sorting or min-max value sorting on the server's side. And the two ties that we're creating are these double square back brackets, this indirect reference concept. And, and maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not, directly expressing the importance of this, but it's the, it's the dot notation, the dot data, because we need to use the empty cars data set, something familiar to the server's side, and then expressly use the variable that was asked by the user from the UI as a calculation point or, or, or a populated point, and then be able to filter that input. Without this dot notation and without these square brackets, the server will have no idea what you're talking about and you're going to get erroneous output. You're going to get erroneous failure. Okay. Let's go back to the chapter. Uh, it says most other problems can be solved by combining the dot data with your existing programming skills. For example, what you want, what you, uh, what if you wanted uh, to conditionally sort in either ascending or descending, uh, descending order. Um, in this case, uh, what we're doing is using the, excuse me, didn't need to do that. Uh, we're using the arrange function to achieve that. Instead of just sorting, we're actually going to arrange it and provide a uh, descending or ascending order selection. Um, I didn't render this code snippet, this one I don't, I didn't, I didn't populate. 
Um, as you provide more control, you'll find that the code gets more and more complicated. That is a true statement. The more options you provide the user, the more uh, variables that you create from your UI's point of view, the more complicated your server function is going to be. And it becomes harder and harder to create a user interface that is more comprehensive and user friendly. That's why it's always uh, focused on code tools for data analysis. Creating good UIs is really, really, really hard. Right? Um, all too often, and I, I, I find myself doing this so, so many times, I have to pause, stop. What exactly am I trying to do here? What am I trying to convey to our user? How do I create this uh, particular logic to best convey the information I'm wanting the, the user to have access to? And you have to stop and, and think of the methods in which you want to populate that, um, that output, right? What am I trying to tell the user? Uh, whether that be in a dplyr sorting function or if that's in the ggplot uh, graphical object form of, of output. How can I give them the, the reins to the, to the uh, cart uh, or, or keys to the castle or whatever acronym you want to use? Um, how can I give them control, but then keep them within a boundary of, of what the data set is providing them? Okay. Um, I did not, I did not use supplied data. This, all of this particular chap or section of the chapter, uh, we're referring to data that's being passed from the user into the function itself. And there's two things that we're really careful about. They were referenced earlier in the chapter, uh, earlier in the book, uh, where uh, you, you want to be careful and, and what data is being passed into the server. Um, there are really easy ways in that reference to uh, inject malicious code into a server, um, take control of things, et cetera. So you want to be careful. Uh, and then the second is the user is already familiar with the data that they have by passing it into it and then rendering it. You as the author of this shiny app will have no idea of what this data looks like. So there's going to have to be some not ephemeral, uh, there's, there's going to have to be some logic of what you're intending for them to, to populate. For example, if we know we have a named object and we want to sort that named object, I have no idea what that name is, but it doesn't really matter, right? As long as I know what they're selecting, I can sort from that columns perspective. The, uh, the reason I didn't render this particular code snippet was I didn't have a data set to, to uh, populate with or, or one that was um, free and widely acceptable. I guess I could have probably created a CSV file from the empty cars data set and then back populated it into the, into the application. But um, I, would, I would encourage anybody to try this out with your own data set and then follow exactly what we're doing. The idea, the intent, the purpose behind why this is important you don't really need to know what the name of the variable is. That's not, that's not necessarily an important element. We can create a dynamic environment that would automatically know what that named variable is. And so we're creating this dot notation, right? Dot data and then input variable, dot data input variable. We don't necessarily need to know what the data is because the, the, the named function for us as the author of the Shiny app, we're just calling it input var. Um, I bet you if we go back up here, this Vroom function is, is sweeping up, or I think Vroom is, a, is a being able to wrangle data, correct? I think that's what Vroom does. But input data and then data path. By populating the data set into the server, um, now the UI and the, and the uh, server both have access to those named variables. I'm really uncomfortable with this concept without, without populating it and showing you what I'm doing. I'm, I'm kind of just discussing the topic without actually knowing what the code base does. All right, uh, last section is we are going to be referencing when not to use base R, and then this tidy selection. Um, when not to use base R. 
at this point, you may wonder uh, if you'd be better off with just without the filter function and all of this dot notation and square brackets referencing. Um, however, um, it actually gets really, really, really convoluted uh, using a base R to replicate what the filter concept does. In this example, we can use base R to say data frame, data frame, input variable, input minimum. And we're gonna get the output that we're expecting. Um, that's totally legitimate. There's no problems with this. However, you'll need to drop the word false from the data frame only, uh, only contains a single column. Uh, otherwise you'll get a vector instead of a data frame. The second is you'll need to use a which function uh, or similar to drop any missing variables, uh, like like if na equals or is na, drop that uh, from the the equation, and then you you can't do a group wise filtering. So df piping over to group by some named variable and then filter by n equals one. Uh, that's not possible. In general, if you're using dplyr for very similar cases, you might find it easier to use a base R function that doesn't use data masking. Before I go further to that sentence, I just want to be clear. If you as a user choose to use base R, go ahead and follow that path. If, if that's a comfort for you, go ahead and follow it. If you want to evoke the tidyverse, then follow that path, use tidyverse. What I would caution any user, any person that is, is doing any data manipulation or, or scripting in general, please be very cautious of mixing base functions versus tidyverse functions. Not saying that it can't be done, but it makes your code really, really difficult to interpret what exactly you're doing because of the syntax of base versus tidyverse. They have very, very, very different meanings. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with using base. There's nothing wrong with using tidyverse. It's when you combine the two together in one script that it becomes extremely Frankenstein-y looking. And that's to be avoided. So choose one path, stick with that path, whichever choice you want to make. Uh, Frederica, as an experienced user, do you want to add any comment to that statement? The, yeah, the I agree with you. Code? Yeah, I agree with you. I feel comfortable using tidyverse more than base R. But sometimes I use base R for very simple things like selecting elements inside the table and everything. Or so, or yeah. so just those things there. But if I use tidyverse, um, I would usually using the, the base R inside. But here apparently is the case to do that. Yeah. Inside the pipe, do yeah. Well, I even I would I would even throw in uh, another comment. So if you would if you would choose to use mixed tidyverse base R functions, don't put that in the same script. Uh, instead, create a function and then save that as a R function, referencing it and then pulling it back in. So therefore, you're just encapsulating the differences between tidyverse code base and, and base R code base. Um, I've, I've witnessed users or I've tried to debug um, previous users mixing, mixing uh, code base and the code works. And, and the thought process of, of, of any scripting is, if it works, use it. Um, but uh, from a maintenance standpoint or long-term maintenance standpoint, that is not something that's fun. Okay. The last example that I want to share is this tidy selection. Uh, as with any data masking, there's one important part of tidy evaluation, the tidy selection. Tidy selection provides a con uh, concise way of selecting columns by position, name, or type. We can do this inside of dplyr uh, with the select or the across functions. Um, and this is also like the tidy r function of pivot long, pivot wider, separate, extract, and unite. The next topic is this in direction. To refer to a variable indirectly, use any of or all of. Both expect a character vector, environmental variable containing the names of the data variables. I guess excuse me, with my reference to this indirection, earlier I was trying to, to convey this concept of web browser named variable type versus what the server is expecting to see. And I kept saying that um, without the dot data and dot environment, you're not really tying these two together. The UI knows what it's doing, the server knows what it's doing, but both of them together are not able to communicate with each other. 
this indirection thought process of any of and all of allows us to uh, render or manipulate this unknown thought process. If you use all of, meaning select everything, it's going to throw an error because it doesn't know how to sort what you're passing it. If you use any of, however, it's just going to ignore whatever unnamed variable that's not familiar with. And I'll show you this example. I was trying my name uh, in the empty cars data set, and it just wasn't populating anything. So let me show you this uh, example number six and see if I can render this, stop the server. And let's move this back over real quick. And this is going to be example six. Now this is just an any of or, or all of function is what this example is doing. Excuse me, not that one. It's not a very, uh, uh, there's not a lot of app going on here. If I wanted to select and show anything or all of related to miles per gallon, by selecting the variable, I get all of the variables in the empty cars data set with that name. If I include, let's, let's add some more details. So let's do uh, displacement DSP. Okay. I added another column of data called displacement. What about uh, horsepower? Okay. Excuse me, HP. There we go. Just add another column. All right. And then I'm just going to throw it a curveball and say, what about Ryan? What about me? Am I in that data set? And, and what you find happening is it doesn't render anything. Um, I don't know. Let's do elephants. Okay. I'm just throwing out anything that I know is not in there. The point is that by using the function, this is down at the bottom. Let me see if I can go side by side here. This is app six. What we're doing is this all of command. It's just ignoring anything. If I were to change that to any of, I would get an error with my name because it's gonna, it's gonna say that doesn't exist. I can't render that table. Um, I can't give you that information. So I'm gonna give you an error instead. By using the all of, it's just ignoring whatever erroneous data I'm passing to it. So this is the concept of that indirect uh, function call. Excuse me, there we go. All right, last example, and we've got to get getting close to time, I believe. Yeah, we're three minutes over. Do, uh, is it okay if I quickly run through this last bit? Yeah. Okay, um, I'll be very brief. Let me just show you this example uh, seven, or sorry, uh, yeah, example seven. We're using the tidy selection, the data masking together um, by using the functions such as across, is typically used with either one or two arguments. The first argument selects the variables and then the useful functions group by are just distinct, uh, giving us even more specific detail of what we're asking to search for. For example, the following app allows you to select any uh, number of variables and count their unique values. Okay. So the idea behind this distinct or, or unique variables, tell me everything that is unique in that column of information or, or variable name pull out anything that's unique, uh, exclude those variables that have multiple entities. I only want the unique ones. So let me run this code and then I've got one last topic and I'll be done. Stop the server, run example seven. Go, move to the browser. I gotta close these other ones, this is not cool. All right, so in this, we're grouping some of our content similar to what we were doing before. And then we can also add extra variables as needed. Now, what you wanna be careful with by doing this group by is the more variables you add, the more uniqueness you're going to get. So in essence, you should start to reduce uh, your, your, your information, the table that you're presenting to the user. The more variables you select, the more uniqueness you're going to have. So therefore, it'll reduce the size. But the, the n column, right, 
is that uniqueness. So we can look right now, everything is showing the number one. Uh, let's change that back to just miles per gallon, PG. We can see that the value of 15.20, I know that there's two entries in the data frame that have that value. Same with 19.20, uh, 21, 21.4. 20, so this is just a count of the unique uh, data within this based on the search term miles per gallon. Change this to displacement. Uh, we can change that to horsepower. Okay. And what I'm what I'm wanting to express is there's three entries specifically to the named variable horsepower. Okay, data points in that data frame that have the value 175. This is a way that we can uh, sort, distinct, uh, provide some additional logic inside logic or functions inside functions. Okay, last topic, last, last topic. There's a statement about this parse and eval. I'm not familiar with this combination, but I can see why this section of the book is important. Uh, before we go, it's worth a brief comment about paste, parse, and eval. These three uh, easy, simple thoughts that you may use. If you have no idea what the combination is, you can skip the section. But if you have used it, I'll just pass on a small note of caution. It's very tempting to approach it because it, it requires uh, learning very few new ideas, but it has some major downsides. First, because you are pasting strings together, it's very easy to accidentally create invalid code. Um, or if the code can be abused to do something that you didn't want. I have ran in or I've, I've, I've been in com conversations before about SQL injection. And this is an example of where this could be the case. If you were to be manipulating an SQL database and you had this paste uh, parse eval thought process, you could easily combine some logic or, or calls within that database that would ultimately start to shred or compromise the database in general. And that's, that's bad. Like if you had some, well, be careful where I'm going with this topic, but if you had some sensitive information in that database, and then you had this option, what you're doing is creating a vulnerability that a, a, another person injecting or creating some malicious code selection, malicious code could potentially access that sensitive data. This is a very easy way that you can compromise databases. And so the, the author is wanting us, the reader, to be aware of this. Please be careful, don't do this. In fact, I would even, if, if I were to see this, uh, I would be very careful in what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, I'd want to put boundaries around the intent, or I would ask you to change the code base uh, to execute the same manner, objective, but do it in a different way that's a little bit more secure. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And that's a, that's a sediment that um, I continually provide to other users. Just because you can do something does not mean you should intentionally do it. There's alt, uh, ultimately uh, other factors that you want to consider when you're writing your script. Okay. The simple path isn't always the easy, or sorry, isn't always the most secure path. All right. I am finished. Uh, does anybody have questions on the chapter 12 tidy evaluation? If I can give myself my own critique, um, I don't believe that I put as much effort into this as needed. Um, with the R conference going on all week, um, I was really paying attention to that. Um, so I want to apologize for a Saturday morning and uh, looking like I'm jumping around chatter boxing on a particular subject. We're running into this. Great. Yeah. That was great, thank you. I uh, focused on uh, very important things that I didn't notice. So. In the rest of the book, I don't see this being a hot topic. So this is kind of a very unique thought process to have. Uh, we won't see this again. Well, we'll reference it. If, if we're troubleshooting each other's code, we may have to uh, think about this as a subject. But um, 
I, I don't recall seeing code snippets that use these dot notations or double square brackets in the future of our book. At least I don't remember that there was. So, all right. Uh, next week, we, uh, I believe, I'm not mistaken, I believe that uh, Lucy is up for reactive calls, if I'm not mistaken. Double check here. No, Olu, Olu. Um, are you good for the uh, in, uh, reactivity? Yes. Um... Okay. So we'll have we'll have. It looks like a combination between the two. The introduction is usually only a page long, and then just the why reactivity. Um, we'll look forward to. If you have any problems, Olu, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to either one of us, and we can help out. Okay. No problem. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you both have a wonderful Saturday morning, uh, Saturday uh, afternoon. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. We'll see you. Bye-bye.